Let's do it. We're TIG welding cold rolled steel today. A couple of outside corner joints and also a lap joint. And then I will list the settings after those are done. And then we'll do a little cross section test and correlate what we see right here in the puddle to the amount of penetration we get. This is 11 gauge cold rolled steel and I'm going to tack it up into a four sided piece. I'm using these little things called V pads from Strong Hand Tools. Super handy for stuff like this. I'm trying to tack it up corner to corner and I'm using 045 filler. That's one size lower than what I'm going to weld it with. I'm going to weld it with 1 16th ER70S6. I'm using this little CK MT200 welder and a clear Jazzy 10 cup with about 20 CFH argon. I had the machine panel set to about 120 but I'm not full pedal so I'm somewhere between 100 and 120 and I'll list the uh, exact readout of the machine a little bit later in the video. I'm going along at, a, at a, just a medium travel speed here adding filler metal just about once per second. This cup comes in both clear and ceramic versions and I'm using the clear version here strictly to film with because I have found that it kind of lights the area up and helps us all see the puddle better. For those welding students out there, this is technically a 1F position. That means it's in the flat position and it's a fillet weld. Now coming up, we'll do a 2F and there's hardly any difference in, in fact, there's no difference in anything that you do to make it happen. It's just technically a different position. Coming up the end here, kind of watch it real closely, leave the rod in the puddle, back up as I taper off keep from leaving a crater hole, keep from blowing the end away. Just one method, but it works for me. Here's a comment that I get quite often. Hey, when you're ending a weld like that, I see you rest the tip of your electrode right on the metal. Doesn't that contaminate it? I haven't had any problems. I probably wouldn't recommend it on aluminum though. Now for the 2F position. I put a big chunk of aluminum, more like a, a weight on there. Sometimes when you're welding something, it'll get to chattering and you don't want that while you're welding. So I put this big block of aluminum. I've got several blocks like this laying around the shop that I accumulated over the years. And I put it kind of close so that it would also draw some heat out, maybe trap some argon. It's a good idea to have a big block like this for parts when they get to chattering. And it's working. It's doing its job. At the end of this weld, you'll be able to see quite a difference in the, the where the heat tent is, which kind of is an indication of how hot things got. Right now, that little block of aluminum is kind of limiting the heat tent zone to a fairly narrow area. But when I get past it right here, and when I'm done with the weld, you're going to see that wick over much wider. Coming up is a really good example in an arc shot. So let's look at this really closely. I'm trying to keep my arc length equal to or less than the electrode diameter. I'm trying to limit my torch angle to about 15 degrees or so. I'm keeping the hot tip of that rod shielded with argon. Now I'm tapering amperage and backing into the weld. Let's look at that again. Also look at the edges of the puddle. I'm trying to just barely roll those corners over. And again I will show the exact settings here in just a few seconds. Notice the difference in the heat tent like I was talking about. The big block of aluminum really drew the heat out of it and confined that heat tent to a really narrow area but there the last inch or so it was able to spread out. It didn't hurt anything, it's just an observation and it just kind of shows how beneficial chill blocks can be. After reviewing the film, the actual readout on the machine was 105 amps for most of that joint. ER70S6 1 16th filler, clear Jazzy 10 cup with 20 CFH, 332 2% lanthanated electrode. All right, let's do a 2F lap joint now. I'm gonna use the same pieces we just welded. I got the machine set at 120 and that's about what I'm gonna be at. I'm gonna weld this a little hotter than I normally would because I'd like to see what that does, if it gets any more penetration or if it's about the same. You will notice though that I'm a little too hot. That top edge is curling just a little bit more than I would like for it to be. So I'm having to increase the travel speed as much as possible motor on pretty good. Sometimes you have to do that. Still trying to pay really close attention to my arc length, my torch angle, and I'm trying to keep the hot tip of that rod shielded with argon. 
This is a 12 ceramic ferric cup here, so it's a little bit easier to keep the tip of that rod shielded because there's a pretty big blanket of argon, but I'm not coming very far out of the puddle with the tip of that rod anyway. And you can see I kind of scalloped an edge or two of the top edge of that lap joint. These are the settings used for this lap joint here with a number 12 ceramic ferret cup. And again, I guess I do have the habit of resting the tip of my electrode there. I'm just waiting for that post flow to time out. Let's test it. I'm going to swab etch this thing with some nidal etch. First, I'm going to smooth it down to about a 240 grit. I find cut and etch tests are, are the best when you can do the cut and etch and correlate it to what you just saw. So you do it right when the weld is finished. So let's take a look at the leading edge of that puddle right there. It's teardropped. Looks like it's going all the way into the root. But the only way to really tell for sure is to test it. A macro etch test helps you distinguish between base metal and weld metal because the microstructure is different. That weld penetrated all the way to the root and then some. You may notice that this is a little different space I'm in. I'll be setting this thing up as a welding area very shortly. But I'd like to ask you what kind of welding videos would you like to see? You can leave that in the comments. This last two minutes of this video is a flat out commercial for a kit that I put together. So if you wanna bounce, no hard feelings. But I tried to make it informative, entertaining, instructive. The kit has all the most popular, but only the most popular Furic cups for aluminum, as well as chromoly, stainless steel. Two minute long commercial. I appreciate your support. Our customers at weldmonger.com have been asking us for this kit. A good mix of all the most popular Furic cups and also a standard number five for TIG welding aluminum. There's a reason why so many really good TIG welders prefer a number five cup for TIG welding aluminum. It limits the amount of cleaning action that wanders outside the puddle and it just focuses the arc a little bit better. But for steels and stainless steels and chromoly, you're going to want to use a gas lens. This one will let you use all the popular ferret cups from the 8 all the way up to the BBW. Clear and ceramic. The number 8 Pro Clear works great on steel and stainless steel. Gives great shielding and really good visibility. It really lights things up, lets you look through the cup when you need to. But mainly, if you're having trouble seeing that puddle, it really does light the way just like a light bulb. To switch over to a ceramic cup, just pull the cup off, remove the o-ring, and thread a cup on. Switching back and forth from ceramic cups to clear cups is pretty dang easy. The Jazzy 10 Ceramic is one of my favorite cups for stainless and chromoly. It's durable, but it also gives great gas coverage, and you can use a really long stick out when you need to with only the same gas that a number 8 takes. 20 CFH will do the job. There are times when you need a little bit bigger cup with a little bit longer stick out, and you still want to have really good shielding, a number 12 will do you at about 25 CFH. This is plain carbon steel, but it's still doing a great job shielding. Two different insulators are included to make sure it'll fit your torch, along with three back caps, along with three pieces of 332 tungsten. That was the 17 kit. This is the 920 kit. This little collet body also works with O-rings for clear cups. If you got any doubts on what style torch you have, this little graphic should help you. A quick glance at your collet body should tell you which torch you have.